If you're just joining us, uh, my name is Robin Sparkman, and I'm honored to be ProPublica's president. I'm thrilled that so many of our donors could join us tonight. The chat is open, and I encourage you to let us know where you're tuning in from. Now, before I turn it over to my colleague, Charlie Ornstein, I want to take a moment to thank all of you for supporting our reporting. It's because of your generosity and your belief in our work that ProPublica is the largest investigative newsroom in the country and the winner of six Pulitzer Prizes. Our mission, as you all know, is to use the moral force of investigative journalism to spur change. And as we head into an election year, the need for accountability journalism that makes a difference is even more urgent. I'm so glad that you've joined us tonight to hear about three of our current investigations into local elections. So now I'm gonna turn things over to our managing editor for local news, Charlie Ornstein, to share more about the growth of local initiatives at ProPublica. Charlie oversees our local reporting network, as well as ProPublica offices in the Midwest, the South, the Southwest, the Northwest, and a unit operated with the Texas Tribune. As a reminder, close captioning of the program is also available and can be enabled by clicking on the closed caption option on the bar toward the bottom of your screen. Okay, so now I'm gonna let Charlie take it from here and ask him to come on camera. Thank you all. Thanks so much, Robin. Uh, and thank you all for joining us for this important discussion. A few days ago, it's hard to believe, I celebrated my 15th anniversary at ProPublica. And every day I feel blessed to work here and grateful for the support of donors like you who, who make our work possible. As some of you may know, when ProPublica started, uh, and back when I joined, we were a national news organization. Almost all of our staff was based in New York, with the exception of a couple people who were based in DC. We believed and continue to believe in the power of journalism to expose things that aren't working as they should, with the hope that people of good faith on both sides of the aisle will work to fix problems. If you could bring the receipts, showing that a problem actually exists, and show how it can be fixed. Back in 2017, we began to realize that it wasn't enough to have a national footprint, that the true crisis in journalism was at the local level, and that ProPublica had a role to play in that. We assigned a reporter to cover New York City, we opened an office in Illinois, and we created our local reporting network, a program in which we pay the salary and benefits of reporters in local newsrooms to work on important accountability projects. We provide them editing support and other resources that our journalists have, have access to, and we co-publish their work. Since then, our local work has grown exponentially. As Robin mentioned, we now have five local offices with 30 staff reporters stationed in 15 states, and we have another 20 local reporting network projects. I'm really proud to say that our local team accounted for 60% of the impact generated by ProPublica last year. One of the most important topics we're covering, and the one we're going to talk about tonight, is threats to democracy. This is certainly a national issue, but it's also very much a local one, and we're well positioned to cover it with reporters on the ground in Wisconsin, Texas, Georgia, and Arizona, all states that play a key role in both state, obviously state, and national elections. We believe that by documenting threats facing voters, efforts to undermine the will of voters, and showing the consequences of laws, people can be informed, ask questions, and sometimes demand changes. Our discussion today will take us from South Carolina to Texas to Wisconsin. And as Robin said, we'll have plenty of time for questions. Now I'm going to transition us over to today's featured investigations, where we'll be looking at the small circles casting a big shadow over local elections. And I'd like to kick off our conversation with Marilyn W. Thompson's reporting in South Carolina. Marilyn, can you join us on the screen? Hi, Charlie. Hi, Marilyn. Um, so just yesterday, we got word that a panel of federal judges had thrown out Alabama's latest congressional map because lawmakers in that state didn't create a second majority black district. The judges, in fact, took the power away from the legislature and ordered that a new map be independently drawn. And it felt so timely because your coverage of South Carolina raised many of the same issues about map making in the Palmetto State. 
So tell us about what you found. Yeah, Charlie, I, I am from South Carolina uh, and decided that it would make a really good story to try to look at South Carolina's redistricting process, which, as you know, redistricting is something that occurs every 10 years after a new census comes out. Um, and I didn't really know exactly what to expect. I was most interested in Congressman Jim Clyburn and what role he might be playing in the redistricting effort. He, of course, is a Democrat in a state that has turned overwhelmingly Republican. Uh, so I began with this sort of central question, uh, how did it work? Well, this is an interesting story because, as you note, in this case, you had a powerful Democrat who actually worked with Republicans to create a map that was in his own interest, but not necessarily in the interest of others in his party in the state. That's not something I would have expected. Uh, is it something you expected? No, oh, I, I didn't expect it. Um, I mean, I knew uh, theoretically that members of Congress have influence on the redistricting process. But Clyburn was in a very special place because he was the only Democrat in the congressional delegation, uh, a total Republican controlled legislature and state government. And the process of redistricting is a state level process. So members of Congress are not necessarily supposed to be calling the shots on what goes down. Uh, but what I discovered through investigative work was that Clyburn was very much involved and his wishes were being communicated to the Republicans through one of his aides based in Columbia. And I love what I love about your work is that you not only sort of have this through interviews, but you really brought the receipts. Uh, one of the things we talk about ProPublica doing, talk about like how you got the receipts and what those receipts were. Well, it was very challenging because I, I did go into it not really knowing much about redistricting, which uh, it's supposed to be a, a public open process, but it's one of the most secretive things going out there. A lot of behind the scenes uh, manipulations and backdoor deals are being cut as they decide how to draw these districts, whether it's House, Senate, Congress. Um, so I, I began the investigative process of seeking documents looking where I could uh, to, to put in freedom of information requests, uh, and also uh, went through a very extensive court record because the, district, uh, the districts were subject to a lawsuit that was brought by the NAACP charging the state with racial gerrymandering. So there was a court record the size of my living room <laughs> So in many ways, this reporting brought you full circle. You mentioned being from South Carolina. You started your career as a cub reporter in Columbia, South Carolina. And just as Jim Clyburn was starting his career uh, in government as a state bureaucrat there. Uh, and you had some early interactions with, uh, with Representative Clyburn. Tell us about them. Yeah, it's funny. I, I wrote a story about Jim, Jim Clyburn uh, as the first Black uh, appointee of Governor John West. Uh, he was the first Black to hold a state government position in, in a really long time in South Carolina. And, um, and I was assigned, as you said, a cub reporter, and I got his state agency. So I wrote a story about him that ran in a paper that no longer exists uh, in Columbia. And um, I kind of, you know, I've written thousands of stories over the years. I sort of forgot about this one. But when I decided I wanted to interview him, turned out that Jim Clyburn remembered it much better than I did. Well, so tell us what he remembered. <laughs> yeah, he, he would actually, through his press uh, secretary, said that he remembered the story I had written in the mid-70s. And that he even remembered his favorite quote and my favorite, the question I had asked, which, which was a very simple question about uh, what his goal was, why he was uh, feeling that it was so important for him to 
be part of state government. And he remembered every word of it. It was pretty stunning. He's, you know, 80, 82, 83 years old at this point. So several decades have passed. You sit down for another interview with him. Uh, what was he? What did he tell you this time when you met with him? Yeah, it was a long and winding interview uh, about the subject of redistricting. And he told he's a storyteller. He speaks in this sort of preacher's baritone voice and loves telling stories about the Deep South and about his interactions with South Carolina's segregationist leadership when he first was coming to power. So he told some stories and then we got around to the subject of redistricting and he had taken some heat in the local media uh, about uh, the, the notion that he was trying to steer redistricting to get a district that was favorable to him. And he got furious talking about it which for a reporter is often kind of a tip off. There's more there, more than meets the eye. So you kept looking after that interview and that's where you found even more stuff, right? Yeah, after I saw his violent kind of anger over this criticism that he was meddling in the district, uh, I, that's when I really launched the search and discovered that, yeah, yeah, he did. <laughs> And what the Republicans were charging was essentially true. So what's super interesting to me is that Alabama, which has gotten a lot of attention, is not the only state that is sort of got, is getting scrutiny from the Supreme Court with respect to redistricting. Uh, after your story ran, the Supreme Court agreed to hear the case involving South Carolina's map in the coming fall term. Um, yeah. wh what yeah. is the case about? Did that actually and, and did that surprise you? Well, it surprised me because everyone assumed that the decision of the lower court was going to stand. And the lower court in the NAACP lawsuit did find that South Carolina's Republican legislature drew a map that included a racial gerrymander. Um, what my story revealed was that it was a little more complicated than that, that in fact, uh, Clyburn, as the highest elected Black representative in the state, had actually asked for some of the changes that were made. And so it posed a very interesting question that, uh, you know, I don't know how much the court will focus on this, but it certainly came as a surprise to everyone that they wanted to hear oral arguments uh, in the case because the Republicans want to tell the story of what Jim Clyburn asked for and how it shaped the map. And so when this case, I think it's October, right, that the justices are going to hear it, what will you be listening for, looking for during oral arguments? Well, I will certainly be listening and, and seeing how often, if at all, Clyburn's name is mentioned. Because in the, um, the lower court, it was a, a big part of the case. And the Republicans really, the lawyers for the state lawmakers really honed their arguments to point a finger at Clyburn and say, hey, you know, you ask for these changes that are later uh, being described as a racial gerrymander. So we'll, we'll see what happens. I mean, you never know. The cases, um, in the deep south states are very highly charged. Uh, Race is, is everything because essentially racial gerrymanders are the only thing that's still illegal uh, in redistricting. Partisan gerrymanders, the court has ruled that those are okay. And so what we're seeing here could be a very important national precedent. Yeah, you mentioned that redistricting is this once a decade process, and yet here we are in year three of the decade, and uh, we are still dealing with redistricting. Uh, in, up here in New York, as you know, uh, mm -hmm. there they may end up opening the congressional districts up again. Alabama still a living question. In Florida, uh, a judge sort of has taken aim at some of the maps drawn by Governor Ron DeSantis down there. Uh, the South Carolina case. Um, 
is redistricting going to be one of these things like electioneering that actually isn't actually over until it's ready to start doing it again? I'm afraid it will be because uh, I'm working on a story now that that looks closely at the legal process with these redistricting lawsuits and the tactics that are used by the party in power to drag out the case. And so uh, we're seeing Republican legislators um, use all kinds of tactics, uh, claims of privilege, uh, refusal to give depositions because in fact they're privileged, um, they, they want to slow these things down. The only problem is if, the, if it is a discriminatory map that's in place, the longer that drags out, the longer people have been discriminated against, which is what you're seeing in states like Alabama and other deep South states that have been challenged. I, I'm so glad that you are continuing to report on this issue. I know our our readers and the folks on this call will be looking for your future stories. Uh, so thank you so much for uh, for joining us tonight. Thank Marilyn. you, Charlie. All right, now I'd like to turn the conversation over to Texas editors Aira Torres for a conversation with reporter Jeremy Schwartz. They'll be discussing a ProPublica Texas Tribune report on what appear to be recent violations of IRS rules prohibiting religious organizations from endorsing candidates. Zara, would you like to take it from here? Sure, thanks, Charlie. Um, Jeremy, as, as Charlie mentioned, this story is quite different from the gerrymandering story that uh, he and Marilyn just discussed, but it is one that uh, still has the, you know, focuses on a um, an aspect of influencing elections that is really important and has become uh, one that is used quite frequently in Texas. Um, I wonder, you know, you found, you know, one of the things that you found is that pastors have become much more prolific and brazen when it comes to endorsing candidates, despite a federal law banning tax exempt organizations from doing so. And, you know, some of those examples were quite striking. One was, you know, a pastor who framed uh, the candidate that he supported as God's choice in the election. Um, another was one, a pastor who described uh, New Mexico's governor as the wicked witch of the North and who urged people to vote against her in his congregation. And, you know, you also ran into interesting situations and communities where you had dueling endorsements. You had one pastor who uh, had supported a candidate and another pastor uh, who was rallying behind their opponent. And, and you found this on both sides of the aisle. I wonder if you can talk and explain a little um, what prompted this investigation and, and what that reporting entailed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, this project really kind of grew out of some reporting uh, that I had been doing in Hood County, Texas, which is a rural area uh, southwest of Dallas, um, where a group of uh, far right uh, Trump supporters were uh, in the process of, of trying to push out and eventually succeeding in pushing out their elections administrator um, as part of uh, some of the claims uh, regarding the 2020 election. Um, and while reporting, it was, it was, you know, sort of surprising to me to see some of the opposition uh, to the election administrator sort of couched in, in very religious terms um, and, and local churches playing a role um, not just in, in this sort of saga, but in, in local politics generally down there. Um, for example, one of the, pa the pastor of the church where the uh, Hood County uh, GOP uh, club met monthly um, had prophesied uh, in front of her, of her parishioners that Trump would be reelected uh, before the 2020 election. So this was um, uh, all, all sort of eye-raising um, for us. And, um, you know, we knew that uh, churches endorsing candidates, pastors endorsing candidates from the pulpit is, is not legal. And they can, they can lose, you know, the IRS prohibits that. Um, there are some concerns about uh, potential 
uh, donor anonymity that, uh, you know, in, in terms of churches becoming full-fledged endorsing entities. Um, and so they can lose their, their tax exempt status if, if they violate this, this very clear prohibition by the IRS. So we set about to, um, you know, basically see how common this is around Texas. We, you know, what we're seeing, it, it, I mean, we're sort of seeing it locally. Um, and so my reporting partner, uh, Jessica Priest and I sort of set out to uh, gather and watch as many sermons uh, as we could. Um, and this was an effort, you know, I, I think pre-COVID would have been very difficult, if not impossible, to, to do something like this. But since the pandemic, a lot of churches have put their uh, sermons online. So we spend weeks, if not months, um, uh, watching sermons, uh, sort of beginning in Texas, in North Texas, um, and, and leading to other places. And in the end, as you mentioned, we were able to document um, 20 instances where experts told us uh, pastors had crossed the line uh, and violated uh, what is called the Johnson Amendment, which is the IRS prohibition on um, on on uh, endorsing candidates. And uh, so at, at that point, we set about trying to look into how the IRS enforces its its uh, its prohibition um, and uh, sort of the fact that that the agency hasn't uh, disclosed much in 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 about a decade about this. Jeremy, you know, speaking of the IRS, I think one of the startling findings um, in the investigation was that the number of violations you found during the two-year period that you really focused on was actually greater than the total number of churches the IRS has investigated for intervening in political campaigns over the past decade. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how that's possible. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think that really does speak to the, the lack of enforcement action uh, by the IRS uh, for for many years on this, and their their lack of transparency and leveling with the public uh, about um, how they handle uh, a very clear prohibition in their rules. Um, you, you know, it, it, many experts believe that you know, the issue is so sort of politically fraught for the IRS to take on churches, to investigate churches, that they um, prefer to, to sort of put it to the side altogether. Um, and what we saw in our reporting was churches and pastors who have become quite emboldened by this um, and feel that uh, the IRS may not uh, be coming after them and so are engaged in sort of testing the IRS's will um, to act. Um, and, uh, you know, even since we, since our, our, our project ran, we are seeing some of those same churches that were publicly um, revealed to have been, been violating uh, this rule uh, continue to, to very publicly make um, campaign endorsements. Yeah. I mean, I think that's an interesting point because, you know, often in investigative journalism, we think about, you know, the, the impact that the work has. And we talk about the impact that the work has. And in this case, you have, um, you know, a law that clearly states that uh, non-exempt, non-tax exempt organizations cannot publicly endorse candidates. And you have examples of this happening time and time again, um, yet it's unclear what the IRS will do, if anything. Um, I wonder how you think about, as you, as you think about these stories, which we believe are important stories and important investigations, um, how you think about impact. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, the, the hope going into Sort of any any big project, any big investigation is um, that you will bring about some some kind of change and some some kind of action. Um, 
I think though, going into this, we, we you know, we weren't um, really believing that this project would convince the IRS, you know, that they're suddenly, you know, going to wake up and, and start enforcing their, their prohibitions, although that would be amazing if, if they would, um, <laughs> and you never know. Um, but, you know, I think it was important to us, you know, especially on the ground, um, seeing uh, sort of the division and polarization um, that, that these uh, endorsements in this rhetoric uh, brought to local communities that we saw in counties and towns, in school districts, um, uh, was, was really quite something to see. Um, and, uh, you know, the feeling that we got, you know, for, for, for several reasons was that this, this, you know, is probably going to be a feature uh, in some form or another of Texas elections on the local level in, in some communities. Um, and so the, the state and the communities deserve to have a, a, a public conversation about that and what that means to have churches um, uh, play such a role in their communities. And so I think that was uh, you know, our, our, really our goal was to start generating some of those conversations and discussions, especially in some of the, the, the smaller towns and counties we were covering. I think, you know, one way in which uh, you did that, that, you know, I think is, was really important and effective was you not only had the in traditional kind of investigative piece that you would normally write, but you had a separate piece that took each of the 20 instances uh, that you had mentioned in the initial piece and broke them down, showing the video, showing the you know, analysis by experts who looked at each case independently and did not speak to each other, uh, but who came to similar conclusions. You had you know, the, the place in which you showed that you reached out at pretty extensively to each church. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about why it's important to show your work in this way. Yeah, yeah, and, and especially on something like this, um, which, which is a topic that um, generates a lot of opinion, a lot of emotion, a lot of uh, attention. Um, we didn't wanna just come to the readers and say, you know, we found 20 violations, trust us, these are violations. <laughs> um, we wanted to to show them what what we found, so they could see for themselves um, what was said, the context of what was said, um, and uh, and hear from from you know these long term uh, nonprofit tax experts and sort of draw their own conclusions. You know, it, it, it was you know we're not trying to force feed our conclusions onto you. You know, we want you to see, see what we found and, and see if you agree or disagree. Um, and I think we also very much wanted to be transparent about, about what we were doing um, with the churches. And so we spent weeks or months uh, reaching out to every single church we we mentioned in the story, uh, churches and pastors, to try to get um, response from them. You know, we're is, are we is there some context we're missing about what was said on this Sunday in the pulpit? Um, did did the pastor misspeak? Did the pastor are we you know hearing him wrong in some way? And so it's just really important for us to be as open an open book in terms of these. Um, uh, of these moments um, so that, you know, the world could see what, what we saw and, and it wasn't us trying to bring um, our own conclusions to it. Jeremy, you talked a bit about it. You, you've talked several times now in this discussion about kind of this, these divisions that, you know, you have seen being stoked in communities. Uh, by churches who are endorsing candidates. Was that surprising? And if so, why? 
Um, yeah, it 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 really was. I think I think the sort of the most surprising part of this was some of the rhetoric and, and language we were hearing in sermons and in churches. Um, um, you know, as you sort of alluded to in, in your introduction, um, really um, divisive language uh, in, in the language of us versus them, um, two sides of a war. Um, uh, opponents aren't just, you know, the, and, and we're talking about county commissioner candidates in, in, in small rural counties are not just, you know, your neighbors who have a different political outlook uh, and are, are running for local office, but are, are demons, are uh, Jezebels, are uh, evil spirits. And um, I, I think that was one of the things that struck me most about what we were hearing and sort of, um, uh, you know, sort of set off some alarm bells of how this might even look going forward into the future. I want to wrap up so we have uh, time for um, the rest of the program, but did want to ask you a bit about, you know, as we're thinking about, you know, the upcoming election, upcoming presidential election, what are you thinking we will see when it comes to, you know, the involvement of uh, churches in political races? Yeah, well, we when we published uh, these stories, um, we also did a, a reader call out and asked readers to to write in and tell us what they are seeing in their communities, um, and we're frankly, you know, sort sort of overwhelmed with how much um, folks came back with. Um, so we know that this is this is going on across the country. Um, you know, and, and obviously, as we get closer to 2024, is something we are going to be keeping um, a close eye on. And um, I, I know for for our team, um, you know, this intersection of faith and religion and and politics is something um, you know that we consider quite important. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Thank you to Zara and Jeremy for shedding some light on how religious organizations may be involving themselves in elections. I'd now like to invite Midwest editor George Papajohn and reporter Megan O'Match to join us on screen. Uh, they'll be discussing several investigations into the people peddling election conspiracy theories in Wisconsin and the effects they've had on the voting process leading up to 2024. George, would you like to take it from here? I sure would. Thanks, Charlie. I'm very happy to be here with uh, Megan O'Matz um, from our Midwest team. Um, she's based in Wisconsin. She's been there since uh, 2021, and I've been working with her uh, since late 2022. Over the last two years, she's spent a lot of time traveling throughout Wisconsin and writing numerous stories about the influence of billionaires and activists on elections in Wisconsin, on She's explored venomous school board races, attacks on the League of Women Voters and other topics, um, has focused quite a bit on the Wisconsin Elections Commission, uh, which oversees the mechanics of elections there and um, has, has basically been under attack uh, ever since, uh, even before the polls closed in 2020. Um, Megan, you came to ProPublica from Florida um, you had never lived in Wisconsin before you moved to Milwaukee, um, as an outsider, but you knew, you know, I'm sure like most of us, that's a key, key state, uh, for, for elections and this country a swing state, but what did you, once you started spending time there, what did you learn and what surprised you as you began studying elections there? Thanks, George. Yeah, um, I spent 20 years in Florida. I was covering crime and government and um, elections, schools, and overall Florida lunacy. And I, um, I basically thought coming to Wisconsin that um, it would be maybe a little calmer where common sense prevails and people are pretty even handed and um, and all, but um, I was I was wrong. There's it's quite lively here. The politics are every bit as uh, surprising and as contentious and as absurd as um, as in as in Florida. Um, 
So I met a lot of interesting uh, people and characters that I've written about, and I felt important that to really show who is spearheading the election denial efforts here uh, in Wisconsin. And they include established organizations. Um, there's the Thomas More Society, which is an anti-abortion group out of um, uh, Chicago that I've written about that really uh, delved into election denial work. Um, there are new grassroots organizations, GOP lawmakers, there's um, some just basically misguided individuals who they're spreading conspiracy theories, um, including a retired hypnotherapist here, um, a convicted fraudster I've written about, a former state Supreme Court justice, um, and others. So it was um, it was really dizzying for me at first to jump into this new state and this new topic, basically, of you know denying uh, the integrity of our election. So I realized it was such a vast landscape that I had to build a spreadsheet to keep track of this and um, uh, to keep track of all these numerous groups and, and people involved. Um, a lot of this disinformation, uh, you, you may know, is spread on uh, the radio and podcasts. Of course, there's groups like Steve Bannon and his uh, War Room, but there's also others that I'd never heard of before, or uh, like the First Right podcast, which is hosted by a failed Illinois Senate candidate. And uh, he runs a pack that's financed by the billionaire Richard Line for the most part. Um, and But there are other po podcasts too with names like the uh, Alpha Warrior Show and um, they feature election deniers all the time. So I, I try to check in with them and see um, what they're saying, who they're having on, what their next target is or their next um, theory. And um, my, uh, my spreadsheet has almost 200 entries and it now includes names of, of social media sites too that I keep learning about. You know, it's not just you know, Facebook uh, or Twitter where folks congregate, but also um, on things like Discord and Rumble and Getter, Gab, and um, um, also there was something I found called GiveButter.com, which is a fundraising site. And um, when, whenever I see someone mention, oh, find me on, like someone had MeWe.com recently, then I just add it to my spreadsheet. So this is another way that we can really uh, track what, what these folks are saying and doing and are, are concerned about. Um, Meg, one of the first things that you and I talked about, um, I know, was something um, called Zucker Bucks, which I was not completely familiar with, actually not familiar with at all. Um, and it turns out that in over the last two years, Zucker Bucks has come up a lot in your conversations with people and in your reporting. Can you explain a little bit what Zucker Bucks are and why they fed into sort of the conspiracy ridden climate that we have now. Yeah, Zuckerbucks refers to about $350 million in grants that Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg gave to election offices uh, nationwide to help carry out the elections during the pandemic. And he wanted to help pay for more ballot drop boxes and hazard pay for a lot of the poll workers, you know, they were afraid afraid to come. We had they needed more ballot scanning machines for all the absentee ballots and all. So the GOP felt that this money, though, was unfairly going to Democratic cities and was basically tilting the scales. Even though the grants were given to like two thousand five hundred municipalities nationwide, including places that had a history of voting for Trump. But one helpful tool that I and a lot of other journalists use is to um, make a timeline so we can better understand a controversy when we um, when we, we plot it out. And so I could go back and look through um, lawsuits and complaints with the Wisconsin Elections Commission to better understand it. And, um, and looking at my timeline, I, I saw, well, the first instance of a complaint about this Zuckerberg money um, was made by a Wisconsin man named Jay Stone. And I thought, well, you know, who is this Jay Stone? It turns out that he's a retired hypnotherapist. His dad had been a uh, Chicago uh, alderman and uh, Jay had lost um, elections in Chicago and he blamed the Democratic machine for working against him, which, which it did. <laughs> um, but so I was able to write this really interesting story about this man, this Jay Stone, who his theories really launched this Zuckerberg 
controversy and it had a real snowball effect because now at least 20 states um, have banned these private grants to election offices. And again, this man, Jay Stone, that, you know, really very, very few people had heard of, he ultimately played this crucial role in making Wisconsin this hotbed of conspiracy theories. Um, this former Supreme Court Justice Michael Gableman, who was appointed to lead a, a really partisan audit of 2020, he accredited, you know, Jay Stone and his theory, and he uh, gave it a platform. He, he had half of his uh, Gableman's report ended up being about this, um, this Zuckerbuck's problem. Yeah, it was really um, interesting when you brought up Jay and his background and being, a, you know, former Chicago Tribune uh, editor and reporter uh, and, and having probably interviewed his dad uh, and knowing a few things about how Chicago elections can sometimes not exactly be on the up and up. Um, it, it was interesting to see what that Chicago stew created in this son of, of the alderman, right? Now up in Wisconsin, um, trying to show that um, everything is is like Chicago in 1968. Um, one of the things I mentioned at the at the start of the introduction here with you was the Wisconsin Elections Commission, um, which you, you follow quite closely. You've written about um, it's a bipartisan agency, so you got three Democrats, three Republicans by law, who commissioners who run it. There's a seasoned professional um, uh, who runs the agency then, um, and their job, its job is to really communicate information, guide these 1,800 or so clerks in towns and villages across Wisconsin. Um, and in fact, it was set up by Republicans not so long ago as sort of an alternative to another form of election oversight that they didn't like. Um, what you've found and what you've written about is just the intense scrutiny um, that this agency has faced. And eventually that led you, as you wrote about the WEC, the Wisconsin Elections Commission, to knocking on the door of a woman named Margaret Bosselman. Can, can you tell us about that? Yeah, um, Marge Bosselman is a, a, a Republican member of the Wisconsin Elections Commission, and she's a retired uh, county clerk, meaning she ran elections for a couple decades um, in Green Lake County, Wisconsin, really pretty area, um, almost central Wisconsin. And she did that with it without incident. She is a professional with this deep knowledge of elections. And she, again, a Republican, does not believe that the election was stolen in Wisconsin. So she knows the machines are tested beforehand. She knows the results are audited. Anyway, the chairman of the commission mentioned to me in an interview that a lawsuit had just been filed against Marge that an election denier named Peter Berniger wanted her off the commission, saying that she really wasn't a true Republican, so she wasn't fit to hold that slot that is uh, uh, slated for a Republican um, individual. So in Wisconsin, uh, the dockets are online. You can look them up on our computer, but you can't see the actual complaint, the document. So you have to go to the actual courthouse, uh, which meant, you know, driving an hour and a half away, I went and got the lawsuit. And then uh, because Marge lives near that courthouse, she actually worked in it, the same courthouse where the lawsuit against her was filed. Um, but I knocked on her door and um, she has an American flag out front. She has a we back the badge sign in her yard. And um, uh, I'd, I'd never met her in person, but she ushered me in. And, um, you know, I told her that I was a journalist. I wanted to talk with her about the harassment that I knew that she um, was facing on the commission um, by Peter and others. And, um, you know, she, this is a basic thing that we do as reporters is knock on doors and you don't always know if you're going to be um, received or not, but uh, that she said she doesn't normally talk with reporters and she invited me to sit down and, um, and uh, she, when I told her I wanted to write about Peter and what he was up to and his tactics, she, she started to cry and uh, she explained to me how hard it's been for her in this small community uh, to have her GOP friends turn against her. Um, the local party had 
publicly disowned her in 2021 because uh, she wouldn't say that the election was stolen. And um, she's a joiner, yet she couldn't go to any GOP events anymore because she didn't think she'd be welcome. And, um, and even her friends and all didn't understand her. So she basically said that she'd been hoping that somebody would expose Peter Berniger uh, for being the bully that he is, not only against her, but against um, the Wisconsin Elections Commission Administrator, another woman named Megan Wolf, and against other election clerks uh, around the county who he also had been harassing and filing lawsuits against and public record requests and all trying to prove um, something that, you know, isn't there, that the election was stolen. Now, it's, it's not illegal, of course, to file lawsuits. There's nothing, um, you know, necessarily un-American or wrong with that. But as you as you backgrounded Berninger, just to serve your due diligence, which is something, you know, we, we call scrubbing at, at, in journalism and in ProPublica, as you, as you looked at, scrubbed his background, um, you found it was there were some things in that background to, that, to put it mildly, were, were, were a little bit interesting. Uh, what, did, what did you find out when you looked at it, in, into that? Yeah, well, backgrounding, again, as a, as a reporter, is a central part of our job, whether we have to background um, a gunman, a victim, a political candidate, certain journalists, you know, write about um, you know, profiles of celebrities, and other people. So backgrounding is something that we're really trained to do and uh, we're pretty experienced in. And ProPublica, we have excellent researchers too who help us. And I turned to one of our researchers, Miriam Elba, for uh, help. And uh, some information had already been out there about Peter. Um, we knew his grandparents had founded the Hillshire Farm Sausage and deli meat company. And we knew that he'd served time in prison for uh, fraud, uh, but we dug into court documents and we realized that some of the same tactics he used in challenging his fraud conviction were also uh, the kinds of things that he was um, doing in his uh, conspiracy theory work. Uh, you know, we found this great quote from a judge that said, Mr. Berniger, you file so many things. I, I, I don't even have time to keep up with it all. Um, so he, he bombarded the Elections Commission with emails and complaints and demands. And I learned from my reporting that um, in early August, the commission had um, sent the police to basically warn him that if he kept um, doing what he was doing, he was going to be arrested for stalking. Um, but again, getting back to sort of like my spreadsheet and all, we, we comb over people's social media posts and um, listen to what they're saying on uh, podcasts and things. And he kept referring to something called Omega for America with the numeral four in between, um, saying that this was promoting some kind of super fast computing method to identify fraud. And uh, when you go to the site, I saw that they were raising money for a nonprofit called Election Watch. You can go to the IRS website, look up charities. I did that. You know, who is Election Watch, Inc.? And here enough, you know, it's true enough, um, Berniger had set up this nonprofit um, called Election Watch that he was trying to raise these donations for. So, um, you know, we, we saw that the trip, the Texas Tribune had mentioned Omega for America in one of its stories and had said it had been initially funded by um, the My Pillow fellow, Mike Lindell. Um, so I got him on the phone and um, he sounds just like he does on TV. He uh, doesn't really talk as much as he does shout. And um, he, uh, he acknowledged uh, funding Omega for America first, but said, you know, he'd moved on to other grander uh, ventures, but, um, and we also found through, again, through Berniger's tweets that he had some association with James O'Keefe too, who um, has uh, the former head of Project Veritas that really um, is known for secretly recording organizations, liberal groups like Planned Parenthood. Megan, there's so much more we could talk about, including, uh, you know, what's currently happening with the Supreme Court there, with um, uh, what might happen at, in the next election, but I believe we've run out of time. And so I'm going to thank you, and, and I think we hand it back to Charlie at this point. Yeah, thank, thank you both. Thanks, thank guys. you, George. Thank you, Megan, for sharing that closer look into the voting processes in Wisconsin. We're now going to turn it over to our Q&A portion, my favorite portion. Before we, uh, but before doing that, 
I'd like to share a link to our event survey in the chat box, and we would appreciate your feedback. Um, and so we're going to, I think I'm going to invite uh, our participants to uh, to all come back on. And um, I think I'm going to start with a question of my own that um, perhaps I will direct first at, at Megan and see if others want to, to jump in, which is, um, you know, do you have... Um, are you worried about sort of the way in which the 2024 election will be uh, will be conducted in your state? Do you have concerns about the integrity of the, of the election, Megan? Well, in Wisconsin, um, we thought that the threat to democracy had eased somewhat when the Democratic governor was reelected. The attorney general uh, is a Democrat. The Supreme Court just now tilted liberal. Um, so those have relieved some of the pressure because these folks um, are not election deniers, but the uh, the legislature, was a, which is controlled by the Republicans, is uh, doing uh, all it can, all it can now still to um, to to stage the election in its in its advantage by changing, trying to change the uh, elections commission administrator, and also they're talking about impeaching this new Supreme Court justice. So um, there's still a lot going on here. I'm, uh, I'm still, yeah, we're, we're, you know, it's still very tenuous here. It's still, it's a battleground state. It's very close, it's gonna be hard fought. And um, I don't, I think there'll still be a lot of issues to deal with here. How about in Texas, Jeremy? Yeah, you know, I mean, Texas is not quite the the battleground that Wisconsin is. Um, although every every election we hear that it, that it, this year it is going to be a battleground, um, but we we are you know for sure seeing I think a lot of pressure on election administrators across the state. Um, uh, we saw what happened in Harris County uh, where the state came in. Um, and uh, basically abolished that position, um, sending it back to a uh, an elected uh, county clerk, and that's something that we are seeing in um, in, in counties across the state, frankly, um, which is a, a somewhat troubling uh, idea because these election administrators are are professional administrators. They they get a lot of uh, um, classes and training. Um, they are, are nonpartisan, and what we're seeing is this effort to put, abolish their offices and put them under uh, partisan uh, county clerks who are elected and in some cases are, um, you know, a, a among those in the state that, that do deny the, the results of the 2020 election. Just really quickly to add to what Jeremy was saying, one of the things he talked about earlier was his reporting in Hood County. And I think what we are seeing in Texas is what Jeremy described as happening, not just in um, democratic counties or counties where the election was close, but in counties where you know Trump won with 80% of the vote. So I think it's a really interesting dynamic um, in the state. Marilyn, what, uh, do you want to jump into that question before we move on to the next one? Yeah, I can just give you one observation from South Carolina, because the, at the time that I was there doing my reporting, there was a, a hearing of the state featuring the state elections administrator, and they brought him in to ask him questions about uh, alleged fraud in 2020, uh, dysfunctional voting machines, um, and he kept he kept testifying to the, before these members that he just wasn't seeing a problem, uh, but the questions were unrelenting, and um, so I think it was a good signal of things to come. Uh, we are going to have to really be alert to to what's happening in local jurisdictions with the election process. Thank you, guys. Uh, that that is. Uh... Great answers, but uh, definitely leave some concern uh, hearing from the three of you on that, uh, the four of you. Um, so let's turn to some uh, submitted questions through the registration form, and then we'll move to take live questions. Again, if you'd like to ask a question, click the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen to submit it to us. 
So a registrant submitted. I'm curious about how investigative journalism works in the trenches, so to speak. How do you know where to look, what to look for, and what are some effective resources for information? Uh, how do you balance what you do with the risks or threat of retaliation? Um, Marilyn, would you like to respond? Yeah, I, I would love to respond because I've been doing it for so many years and feel like uh, I've learned uh, every trick of the trade. Um, you know, every investigative project starts with intense research um, because reporters have to figure out whether some instinct they have, uh, whether there's any factual bearing to it. And so you begin with research, you pinpoint areas where there might be some sort of public record, and that can range from personal record, um, voting uh, registrations, driver's licenses, and, and so on to, to you know, larger bodies of public record, like court filings. And uh, so, so you can literally spend, you know, weeks just getting grounded to go into an investigation and deciding whether it's worth your time or not. Um, and I never mitigate just basic instinct. Uh, I feel like I've had those instincts at work since the days I was interviewing Jim Clyburn as a kid, um, and uh, and I still have it. I mean, my hair literally raises on my head when I see a story that I think someone should look into. Great, thank you. Um, Jeremy, is there a link between the fight against improving the budget of the IRS and the lack of investigation into churches? Where is the IRS person power supposed to come from? And is there a role for civic groups to aid in an investigation of these types of flagrant law breaking? Yeah, so that's a really good question about sort of the relationship between the IRS budget and their enforcement capabilities. Um, and uh, with, without a doubt, you know, over the last 20 or so years, the, the agency has seen its budget um, dwindle to some, to some extent. Um, this past year, the agency got an infusion of about um, uh, 80 billion, um, the majority of which is going to go to uh, uh, strengthened enforcement actions, uh, which you might think would, would be good news on, on this front. Uh, however, the agency has basically said that that money is going to go to three main areas, uh, investigating corporations, investigating um, sort of these complex uh, partnerships, and high, high wealth, high earning individuals. So, you know, investigating um, violations by nonprofits and churches is not on the IRS's uh, list of, of things to focus on going forward as of now. Is there a role then for other groups, civic groups to, to be pointing things out? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and that is actually, um, you know, something that, uh, you know, citizens can do. Uh, residents can, can do that themselves. There is a complaint form um, that the IRS has, and, and I can I can look for that and try to uh, uh, put that on here on the chat. Um, but that you know, everyday citizens can can make a complaint. Uh, there are groups like uh, Freedom from Religion Foundation that sort of regularly uh, make complaints to to the IRS uh, for things like this. Um, the issue is that uh, a lot of times these complaints are made and it's sort of like a like a, a black box and we don't know what happens to these complaints. And, um, you know, I, I think it's probably good, you know, that that folks make the complaints, but the the in full disclosure, the agency has not been very active and vigorous in, in, in terms of, uh, of letting the public know the, the outcome. Of, of their complaints. Although, Jeremy, one thing I learned from you and your colleague Jessica Priest is that uh, the Texas Ethics Commission, at least in the case of Texas, also has a process for looking at these complaints. So it's not just the IRS, right? Some states have uh, have different processes too. That's true. That's true. Um, yeah, in Texas, the Ethics Commission uh, is charged. They can't, you know, they can't yank a church's uh, 
uh, tax exempt status, which is sort of the the the, the death penalty uh, when it comes to this. But they can issue fines and and um, you know uh, do issue fines on uh, uh, campaign related violations. So we have seen some of the some of the churches we've written about. Folks have simultaneously sent to the IRS and uh, to the State Ethics Commission, and um, we're waiting to see the outcome of that on the, on the state level, which um, should be much more sort of transparent than at the IRS level. Great, thanks. Um, turning to you, Megan, uh, how do ProPublica stories get seen in Wisconsin? Do we have a media partner like the Texas Tribune in Texas? Sometimes uh, the Wisconsin Watches run our stories, Wisconsin Examiner, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Um, uh, they could go to our website. I've been interviewed on uh, the local public uh, radio station. Um, George can uh, jump in here too, but um, our stories are getting uh, what more widely seen in Wisconsin and uh, people are becoming more familiar with ProPublica, which is a great thing. Right, and we, uh, Journal Sentinel, Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, we co-published with as well. But it, so it's a variety of places. Yeah, I think one of the things philosophically about our journalism is that we try to get the story out as far and wide as we possibly can, which often means a uh, a variety of news organizations for the same story, that we're not looking to only have it go to people who pay for our work. As, as all you all know, our work is free for anybody, and people can republish our stories. So we actually think the more organizations that pick up the work and mention it and, and republish it, the better. Uh, all right, great. Marilyn, back to you about Steve Bannon, someone you mentioned, uh, someone Megan mentioned, I think you didn't mention him. Uh, how involved is Steve Bannon uh, in all of these conspiracy theories? Well, it's, it's a very interesting question because uh, we did a, a story, uh, I don't have the link in front of me, but it's available, um, a couple of years ago about Steve Bannon and a strategy that he was promoting on his podcast called the precinct strategy. Um, it was basically the idea that if you wanna get involved in changing politics as a Republican, go sign up to be a precinct officer, the absolute grunt level of politics. And uh, this strategy has been hugely successful. Um, there, there is actually a book coming out next year by one of our former ProPublica reporters that I had the opportunity to read a draft. And it establishes the success of the precinct strategy in changing the, Republic, the face of the Republican Party, but also really pushing conspiracy theories at the local level. And a lot of what we're seeing in places like Megan's Wisconsin, uh, if you go back and tra trace the roots of it, very well could be Steve Bannon. Fascinating. Even with uh, even though President Trump is not in office anymore, uh, Steve Bannon continues to have the same, you know, or perhaps even more influence than he had. I, I know even in Texas, Jeremy, um, Steve Bannon's podcast has you know weighed in on the current impeachment uh, trial of the Attorney General, right? Yeah, uh, that uh, the impeachment of Ken Paxton has definitely become sort of a litmus test here in Texas and, and nationally um, uh, with uh, his defenders going on Bannon's show to sort of single out lawmakers, uh, state reps who may be on the fence in terms of voting for or against impeaching uh, Ken Paxton. Um, and sort of uh, trying to influence the um, the trial in that way. Um, so yeah, there is uh, I think a sense that that Bannon and some of the national forces do see Paxton as uh, as a strong ally and somebody who um, you know they 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 want to protect as much as they can. Let's stick with you for another question about back to the IRS, though. Uh, what more is being done to influence the IRS to become more attentive to the issue that you raised today? Well, um, you know, I, I think, you know, probably hearing from uh, folks um, who submit complaints, who 
talk to their their representatives uh, about what they are seeing. Um, uh, you know, it, it might be sort of the best way to influence that. Um, you know, as I think I mentioned before, it, it's not something that the agency, you know, I think given their druthers would 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 uh, would necessarily focus on, and so may need to be sort of pulled uh, into that. Um, and so, public pressure, I think, is 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 probably one way. Um, you know, folks can do that. Um, and and also, I would you know encourage folks to uh, let us know. Um, when you see uh, things that could be violations in your local communities uh, regarding churches, you know, uh, let us know. That's such a good point, um, Jeremy, that ProPublica relies so much on on our readers to share with us tips of things that they think you know, that we should look into. Uh, and I want to share in our chat a link to ways in which people can reach out to us, both securely and through a lot of our forums. Yet we do take tips uh, from readers. They often point us to really important topics. I know in your church's reporting that people pointed out examples of sermons, and they really did help power our reporting. So for those on this call, like you play a role in our journalism, not only supporting our journalism financially, but if you see something, say something. It is so, so important uh, to help us do what we do. Uh, so I want to ask one question about democracy and then one question about the future of journalism. Um, what do you all see, and this is open to any of you, as the weakest link in our democracy, and what could we be doing to address it? Sorry to stump you all. Uh, I thought that was, it's so thought provoking, right? Uh, anyone? Voter participation, I, I, voter participation. We simply have to get more voters out, have to convince people that it makes a difference. I feel like a lot of what's going on is really targeted suppression efforts. And when you look at um, these groups want to be crowdsourcing, to challenge people's voter registrations. Um, we just saw that there was a court ruling uh, in Wisconsin where folks, uh, they, the conservative folks won that you can't use a national voter registration form anymore. And they're targeting, seems to be, you know, big cities, a democratic stronghold. So, that's and cracking down on groups like the League of Women Voters who go to register folks. So this whole uh, this whole uh, activity, a lot of it seems to be directed at suppressing voters, but, uh, the, you know, the wrong types of voters uh, from voting. Uh, and there's right. just the whole it's all, you know, that's not what democracy is. We want everyone to vote. And yet so much of what I see uh, comes down to trying to make it harder for people to vote, you know, make it harder. Yeah, and I can assure folks, we are keeping a close up, a watch on on that, you know, heading into next year. So um, that's a big issue. Uh, Zira, I want to sort of turn to you to talk about local newspapers and reporters and future business models that would make them viable. I think we've all read stories about unfortunate cutbacks of local papers and, and including closure of some. Um, what's the future here? Yeah, I mean, I think this is an important question, but also one of the hardest to answer from, you know, I used to run a local newspaper in my hometown. And, um, you know, it was, it was a really difficult um, financial experience, right? I mean, I think that the future is really thinking about different ways in which to um, ensure that there is local coverage. Some of that is through your traditional newspaper and part of you know, supporting that is making sure that you're reading the stories, making sure that you subscribe, you know, um, larger, um, you know, I used to work for Gannett, larger corporations very much look at you know, those subscriptions, that engagement from the local community to determine the resources that they allocate to those communities. But I would say beyond that, it, it's really thinking 
about how you support local uh, journalism in different ways. You know, there are communities that are now seeing um, nonprofits come up that have, you know, provide, uh, close that gap to some degree. I think our news organizations are doing that, right? I mean, we're all from, you know, my team in Texas is eight people and the vast majority are, of them are from Texas and are from Texas communities and are very much focused uh, on those communities from that local perspective. That said, you know, it's really difficult to cover everything happening in a state that has 254 counties. So I think that, you know, it's a good question. And I think it's one that I always hope that readers are thinking about. Um, you know, nobody has found the silver bullet. Uh, and I think part of it is continuing to innovate, continuing to think about ways in which we personally, um, you know, cover those local issues from a reader perspective and a funder perspective, I think really ensuring that you are supporting those models with which you uh, can relate to and feel are providing you uh, that service uh, by reading, by sharing, by you know, donating what you can, by subscribing to your local newspaper, and you know, hopefully we will we will find a way through for 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 some of these smaller communities that don't have that. So I'd like to open this question up to everyone. You know, as an investigative reporter, do you have an ideal outcome in mind for a piece of your reporting in general? Uh, what does success look like to you? It's funny, uh, for this sort of body of work, Meg and I have, have talked about that a little bit because traditionally it's get laws changed, put people in prison, um, affect some sort of um, uh, really tangible change. I think we're, we're, I think what we're trying to do in some ways is add to the truth that's out there and reveal what's really happening. And that is much harder to measure. And yet it is so vital because when you ask what are the biggest threats to democracy, it's, you know, one of the biggest threats is misinformation. Um, and so I think um, when I see, you know, a, a lot of times what we don't talk about um, in traditional investigative report or in reporting is we do want to influence the influencers, the people who make laws. And we may or may not be concerned with how many people read the story, but I think a lot of it, what we, we do look at the audience a lot of times. Are we reaching people? Is it reprinted? Is Megan on the radio? Um, so it, 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 I think when it comes to democracy, it's a whole different, um, it's a whole different equation for us that we're still trying to figure out. And yet, I think we all really believe that we need to figure it out. If we still have a democracy, I think it's good. <laughs> <laughs> Every day we still have a democracy. <laughs> well, let us let us hope we do. Uh, uh, that may be that say somewhat depressing, but uh, let's hope a hopeful point to end on. Um, that is our time for today. I want to thank all of our reporters and editors for their time with us, uh, as well as for you, our audience, for joining us for your and for your thoughtful questions. Again, this event has been recorded, so you'll receive an email with the full video of today's event. We'll also post this recording on the ProPublica YouTube channel. A link to our event survey will also be added to the chat box. Um, we do appreciate your feedback and, and read it and take it seriously. And from all of us at ProPublica, thank you for joining us and thank you for your generous support of our work. We appreciate it. Good night.